Hello everyone, my name is John Hammond. Welcome back to another YouTube video. And in this video, we're gonna be taking a look at the last challenge that we've got on the November 16th rendition of the Guide Point Security CTF, the Capture the Flag competition that went on this past week. So I am connected to their VPN. I am logged in on the scoreboard at 10, 10, 100, 100. And I can hop on over to the challenges page here. We've finished the Jeffrey box and we finished the Bell box. So all we have left is this 500 point challenge challenge in the challenge category. Nice. It says, ready for a challenge. This one doesn't have a walkthrough and we are given a downloadable file. So I'll copy the link location and then hop on over to my terminal where I've already created a challenge directory for this challenge and I can W get this down. So uh, it whines about a certificate. So let's go ahead and supply that argument that it specifies, no check certificate and then we can download this. It downloads it with the token here, so it looks kind of messy. I'm gonna go ahead and move that challenge and rename it to just simply challenge.zip as the file name should originally be. And of course, it is a zip archive indicated by the file extension, and we can just check it with file to see those file signatures. Let's go ahead and extract this. I'm gonna run unzip on this challenge, and now we're given a spot flag 129833.js file. And this is present here in our current directory. So I will open this up in a text editor and it looks like, it takes a little bit of time to load, we have this thing, <laughs> which is a variable being defined and a lot of hexadecimal characters kind of encoded in a string here. And I'm scrolling with my horizontal scroll bar and this is absolutely ginormous, right? You can see there is a lot of stuff here. So. This seems to be obfuscated JavaScript. We can try and deobfuscate it with an online tool. So let me hop over to our web browser and I'll clear out all the stuff from the previous video. There we go. And now let's look up how we can deobfuscate JavaScript in Google, right? So we have JS nice, which will work for us. And let's try that. Looks like that failed actually. Weird. I'm not running a proxy or anything. I guess we'll just totally ignore that then. Let's go on to this deobfuscate JavaScript and we'll paste this in. This will take a long time to deobfuscate and it actually is already slowing down our browser. If I try and click that deobfuscate button, it finally gets it. But the problem here is that this whole file is like LA tech AH, this whole file is literally three megabytes. <laughs> so even that J JS nice location would yell at us because like, hey, we can't process a file over two megabytes in size. So this one, deobfuscatejavascript.com does actually behave, but it gets a lot of output. So we're gonna have to copy this into a file that I'll go ahead and call deobfuscated.js for JavaScript. Now I'll paste all this in and we can start to examine what this does. Looks like it creates a var ws652, and that's creating a new object or an active X object that allows us to use wscript.shell. Hmm, that's kind of peculiar because that language, an active X object, isn't really pertinent to JavaScript as we traditionally know it in the realm of client side code that can run in your browser. Actually, active X object and using the wscript.shell component there is native to JScript or kind of the Microsoft and the Windows dialect rendition of JavaScript. Interesting and peculiar, maybe we're probably looking at some sort of code that will run commands or do things specific to a Windows target. Then we create this var 0x683c or 638c and that has a lot more of hex encoded stuff as a string. Um, and apparently this deobfuscator didn't do a very good job of actually deobfuscating this because this still seems really messy and hard to understand with the random variable names and all. But um, it, it, we have this function, it looks like, that's being created in line and passed and called with all these arguments stuff into an eval. So that's interesting to me because the eval command is going to try and execute code that's passed into it as if it were a string or let me re reword that. It will take a parameter, it'll take an argument, and that may oftentimes be a string, and it will interpret that string as code and execute it or evaluate it, right? Eval. So that 
tells me and it can tell us kind of as analysts that what is being passed into this function is going to be something that is more code. So if we're trying to understand this, if we're just trying to know what it does and figure out what's happening behind this layer of obfuscation, we just want to see what that code is. So rather than actually executing it and like letting this potential malware or badness kick off, right? We can display out what it's doing. So I can change this eval to a console.log function. And now we can just try and tell the JavaScript like interpreter, right? Whatever we toss this into our web browser, maybe just throw it in a development tool, see if it handles it well, or we could give it to Node or Node.js, that server side kind of runtime environment for running JavaScript code. So let me go ahead and try that. I'll just simply have Node.js, which I have installed and can by default give you a little interpreter, but we'll pass a file as an argument here. We'll use Node.js on our deobfuscated script here. Now, if I run this, it immediately whines and complains. It gets an error because this active X object is not defined. Remember what I was saying, this active X object is pertinent and kind of more necessary in the realm of Windows when we're running JScript. That means that Node.js over here on our Linux side doesn't know what that is and it won't understand it. So we can try to temporarily remove it. In fact, just to do a simple sanity check, let's take a look and see if this WS652 variable is used anywhere else in the code. I'm just gonna control F for that variable name and it only has one match. That is actually all that it's ever used. It just simply defines this object. So if it's completely not needed and our little console.log and trying to understand the rest of the code will run it just fine. Let's kind of comment it out. Maybe the code that comes from this obfuscation technique will end up using it, but we'll be able to see that in the future layers that we peel back. So now let's try to run our node deobfuscated JS one more time. And that had console.log outed again apparently, or I mean, we've run that, and we got all of this noise and nonsense, which looks very, very similar to the obfuscation that we had just seen originally. This is a lot of output, and let's redirect this to like a zero, zero uh, ran.js or something, and I'll move that so you can see. I'm just redirecting with the greater than symbol there. Now let's go ahead and examine what that file looks like. Ah, we could try and deobfuscate this if we wanted to. We could pass it to the exact same web page. And let's let's do that just for the sake of our learning, I suppose. But this looks pretty much like the same syntax, at least the function a B C D E F G and the eval, kind of as we had seen before. So if I were to let this deobfuscate, it really isn't doing anything else interesting here. Um, I am noticing though, that it's creating this var ws random number string object one more time with this wscript.shell activex object. Again, let's look for this variable and it's still not being used in the rest of this strange obfuscation here. We can see all the way at the very, very end of this too, that we are again calling an eval based off of a specific function. So let's use the same technique one more time. Let's change this eval to a console.log so we can see what code it's trying to execute. And as you've seen, now we're actually just getting another abstracted layer of the code and it's slowly peeling off the layers of this onion. Let's see what comes from this layer. We'll node.js 00, zero ran and again, we have to remove that active X object. So let's comment that out and let's run our code. More output with the exact same kind of functionality here, or the exact same trick or gimmick being abused. Let's redirect this one more time to a 01.ran, and let's see what we've got here. I'll open that up. Once again, new WS object with this ActiveX object, wscript.shell, that is not in use, and another var and another eval function. Okay, I think we have determined that there is a pattern here. 
What we can do is we can try and loop this because we don't know how far down the rabbit hole this goes. We've still got a lot of seemingly strange and random hexadecimal characters that are being passed in as a string here. And we keep seeing this eval little Matryoshka dollar. I don't know how to say that. <laughs> I always get that wrong and the internet yells at me. But uh, this technique with a WS object being created still keeps getting in the way and we are going to have to remove it. So... Let's try and write a script that will be able to loop through all of this and funnel down or drill down until we get more code that's better than this eval function or how far deep or, or how many layers do we have to work through. So let's do that. I'm going to create a simple bash script. I'll call this like unravel.sh and let's use the proper shebang line for bin bash trying to type. And let's actually supply it as an argument. So uh, we can supply the file name, right, as sort of a parameter to our script. Let's just test if the supplied argument or dollar sign one, and again, noting as a string with double quotes there, if it's equal to an empty string, then we obviously haven't supplied it. So let's go ahead and echo the like usage can be our unravel.sh script, taking the replace with the dollar sign, and then like the file, right? So after that, we can simply exit. Um, let's verify that this will work with a little chmod plus x on our unravel script and dot slash it. Now we need to supply the file. Okay, so let's pass in the deobfuscated script, but our code doesn't know what to do with it because we haven't written that yet. So let's go start to build out the functionality of what this script will do. We know that inside of our deobfuscated.js file, we have this potential WS652 notion, and that is creating this ActiveX object that does not exist when Node.js tries to run it. We're also seeing that at every single layer of this obfuscation, so we're gonna have to remove that. Let's go ahead and do that. Let's just check, first of all, if this is a, like, new layer of code that we want to try and deobfuscate by the presence of that eval function. Because after all, that's really what we changed here when we tried to run this. So let's simply cat out the file and let's let's kind of create a, a file variable for it. Let's say file can equal the value of the argument that we supply. And let's cat out the file and grep for that eval command. Let's redirect that output to dev null so we don't have to see it. I just want to do this so I can logically test if that grep returns something. The way I'm going to check for that is by using the like return code and we can access that as a variable, right? Let's say uh, dollar sign question mark. If that's equal to a zero, then that means it did actually find it and it had a successful return code. Then we'll do a little check here. Echo, like we have a new layer. How about that? Let's test it and run it, and that condition works just fine. So now that we know that that's a layer that we want to work with, let's try to remove the portion that we know is bad, or that ActiveX object in the W script. So we should probably do that in a temporary file, though. We should probably do that, and if we know we're going to be looping through this, we're going to make the changes to a new file every single time. So let's just copy the current file to like a, a temp one. And then we could, again, proof of concept, just cat it out. There we go. There's all the nonsense. Now let's try and remove this WS variable that's created. And we know that it's going to go through a specific pattern when we've looked through all the other layers manually. It's WS, some sort of digits that's creating a new ActiveX object. Interestingly, that's the first line that we see every single time. So let's use said, in this case, let's use said to substitute and replace this ActiveX object WS script dot shell semicolon noting the very end of that kind of command there, and take it from the very, very start of the string. We'll go with every single character that matches up until we see this ActiveX object wscript.shell. And then we'll replace it with nothing. That way we know that we're removing it. That's what this forward slash here is denoting what we can replace it with. Nice and easy, right? So now that will return out on standard output. 
Let's go ahead and see that here. And I'm gonna pipe this into head just so I can see the very, very top of it. And because there are so many lines, it's not going to work well for me. So I'll pipe that into less. Now that top line is completely removed. I used it with this ActiveX object wscript.shell up to the semicolon purposefully because when we got into these other obfuscation layers, remember we saw each of those with this var ws object with a random number all on a new line. It was all compressed onto one line. So I wouldn't be able to delimit with a new line character. I'm gonna have to trust that the semicolon will be all that we need. So now that we've removed that, we wanna change that eval that we used to see into a console.log so we can get the next layer of obfuscation. Let's do that again with said. We can use said tag i to do that in place on the temporary file. And we can also supply, I believe, just another substitution that we might wanna change. So let's replace the eval with a console.log. Um, let's actually not use tack I to start with because I want to see if we'll get that output the way that we should see it. And let's unravel this here and pipe the output so we can examine it. I'll scroll down to the very, very bottom. Okay, and our eval has not yet taken place. So let's modify this. Let's take the said output of the original one where we remove it and then pipe it into said and then do our replace. That makes a little bit more sense to me. And now that output will be redirected to the next iteration that we wanna use. So let's start to keep track of like an iterator. Let's do uh, iterator equals zero and then new file can equal the iterator and I'm using the dollar sign in curly braces here to denote it because I wanna get just another uh, dollar sign variable in there, iterator and the original file. There we go. So now let's copy new file to temp and set this iterator to a new value after we've redirected into this new file that we've created, new file. Now we want to actually increment our iterator. So I'll do that with let, so I can actually use math in bash. Let's let our iterator equal the value of iterator plus one. And we can't have any spaces because bash is gonna tokenize it and it's gonna be a little bit sensitive. Now we'll want to change our file variable to equal the new iterator with that file prefix in there. So, Let's try and change that up. Let's say file equals the value of new file. Now, when we go through this, um, I don't think I'm doing a very good job of cleaning this variable actually because um, file will equal deobfuscated and the new file will equal zero underscore deobfuscated. We'll do the change and replace and then we'll reset file to the value of new file. Now, when we go back to loop through this again, once we add in our loop, we'll have new file equals one underscore zero underscore deobfuscated. So we're gonna be ending up accidentally staging, but I, I'm, I don't care, I think I'm cool with that. I just wanna be able to see it, build out all the different and, and peel back all the layers of this. So now that we've made that change, then we can redirect it into the value of the new file. We've created that new file, we're iterating and incrementing and we are, resetting our loop. So let's not loop this just yet. Let's see if this proof of concept will work. Let's echo out like iterator, iterator with new file being the value of new file. There we go. Now let's run this just once. Iterator zero with new file creating zero deobfuscated JS. Do we have zero deobfuscated JS? We do, good. Now, this is the deobfuscated rendition though. And we need to actually pass that to Node.js so we can get the next layer. So maybe our logic isn't quite right just yet. 
we're copying this file to a temporary file and then we're outputting it from temp and redirecting it into this thing. So let's make this operate off of the original file, right? And let's make this redirect into temp. So then we can run Node.js on temp and redirect that output to the new file. Does that make sense? Let's try it. Let's see if it'll work. Let's unravel this deobfuscated process. That worked. Now deobfuscated has the original value in here, but temp has the modified rendition of it with the w script activex object removed and eval replaced with console.log. Now we ran that with Node.js and save the output into zero deobfuscated. And there we go. Now we have the next layer and our loop will begin to process that. Now that we have that decent proof of concept, all we need to do is loop this. So let's go back to our unravel script and check if we see eval which is kind of the, the notion that we've been doing beforehand. If we see eval in the file that we're working on, we'll do this loop. If not, we'll fail or break out of our loop. So let's add an else statement here and let's just add a break because we didn't see eval in the script. And then let's make this a while loop with while true. And now let's do and done and let's indent all of this code here. Okay, so now let's try and unravel our deobfuscated script and let's see how many layers we go down. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then it breaks. Okay, so we went down the rabbit hole and you can see it has that weird, funky appending uh, number that I tried to tell you about. But if we check out this final script, what do we have here? Ooh, var vars equals all this and that looks like something new. So let's go use our deobfuscate JavaScript web page and deobfuscate this. Deobfuscate, please. That's not seemingly doing anything. Can I run this, please? Okay, can I like beautify this? Beautify JavaScript, just so it's a little bit easier to read. Online JavaScript beautifier. Paste that in, beautify code, and now we've got this. Okay, so subl like final.js. And what are we looking at here? We have var var set to seemingly a base64 string and we have a DL function. Var b is set to IP addresses and then some weird number here and then we split on it uh by every single space character okay that's a delimiter and then for i is iterating through each object of b well then we go do ahead we do go ahead and use wscript.shell we create an environment variable with a oh no 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 we grab an environment variable and add in a random exe name. Okay, so we're probably setting that to fn like a file name. dn might be zero for like downloading maybe? ActiveX object. Oh, 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 oh. So, okay, so it is going to download from one of the IP addresses with some specific variable key. That might be like something that it's using to keep track of the, the client and getting the fr, what is fr set to? Where is fr? Oh, oh, that's the, that's the string argument passed into it. Nice, okay. So this must be downloading specific files from these, I guess, command and control servers. But we have two IP addresses here, but this other one is really weird. And I have no idea what this is. Is this just like, regular decimal. Let's try and get into B Python. So I'm going to use B Python so I can do a from crypto.util.number import long to bytes. 
And I'm gonna use long to bytes as if it's a decimal string that's actually representing some other data. So let's use long to bytes and I'll call it L to B just so I don't have to type that all over and over again. Let's run L to B with this giant number string in there. And let's see what this returns. Nothing good. I can't read any of that. That's not our flag. That's not really intelligible. That's not human readable. Okay. So what else could this be? It's not a hash, very obviously. It's not hex numbers because I don't see any A through F. Actually, I don't see any... I don't, I don't see any like numbers greater than eight or nine in this. Maybe this is octal. Is this octal? What if I, let's, let's zoom back out. What if I were to do like that number represented in octal format? So Python, I'm gonna use zero and the O prefix to denote that's an octal number. That's converted to decimal. Now let's run long to bytes on that. I don't have anything there. That's really weird. So at this point, I was kind of struggling. I'll be completely honest. I was like, I... WTF, I don't know what to do with this number. Um, it's weird. So I went to CyberChef for a while and I started to just bump around. Um, I, I wish I could give a better clear answer as to how I got to what I got here. Um, but let's, let's try and run magic and see if that will actually get anything. Uh, yeah, I set this to like intensive mode and see if it finds literally anything. Letting it bake for a little bit. No potential things coming through. What if I switch the depth to one? If I search for like a, a crib for flag, does it get anything? No, it tries to XOR the option with hex string and it gets nonsense. Uh, again, not our flag. Is there anything else that comes through here? I supplied the thing flag and I would have expected that to find something, but there's a lot of output from magic, just trying different things. From base 64 over and again, I saw from hex, I saw an XOR. I also saw a rotate. Blah, blah, blah. But no notion of flag so far. Is there any actual can I copy and paste like all this? Copy raw output to the clipboard. Yeah, let's just slap it in. Okay, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> it didn't work. So I'll be honest, when I was looking through all these, I kept trying some of those different things, some of those different options that it was giving to see if it could get potential text. And I had tried like the rotate right one because I did see that here. Like there's a rotate seven here. And I thought like, all right, I guess I'll just try to like rotate right. And I changed it to different amounts, but I had to get this number from decimal, right? Cause this is already decimal data. Let's try to use from decimal. And it doesn't have any spaces in there. I, let's, let's like convert that to hex. Let's take this to hex and let's give it to CyberChef as something that it can easily process and understand. So let's do from hex. And now we can try to use like magic one more time. Magic, uh, intensive mode, bring this down. Oh, and that finds it with that rotate right function with, it, with one as the rotation. Uh, I don't understand why. I don't understand how that happens. Rotate one or rotate right, sorry. Bringing this in and just letting it rotate it once works and gets you the flag. Um, I'm not extremely sure why that happens and why that works. Um, if I were to take that L2B number, like from the original, and if I were to rotate it by one naturally, like within Python, if I use that shift operator and just move the bits to the right or rotate it, it gets the flag. But I don't understand how that comes out of what we had in octal. So... Uh, I think if you literally take this value and we shop around with it, because um, you could try to be like, okay, decode from Octal and look for an online tool. There's a lot of stuff out there, but none of them seem to just straight up get you the flag. 
So input data, octal to text. Submit this, nonsense. Give it to this thing, it needs that weird separator representation and nothing comes out of that. Octal text, that, can't figure it out. Uh, that tool doesn't work all that well. Try this one here, convert. We need to split it into groups of three. You could do that, but this one here, octal system base eight, will convert an octal to a base n converter. And you could slap this in and have it convert to like decimal or binary or hexadecimal. And I would try some of these and I would get a different number that I got within Python, which was weird to me. So I tried to copy this and then do long to bytes from this. And I would paste it in and it would get port of the flag, like a, a portion or, or half of it. But this tool is explicitly telling you like, hey, look, I'm not showing you all of the digits here. I think it says like, we're, we're, we're removing some of these digits and only sharing some of them with you. So I try to like recreate this algorithm that they showcase on this uh, conversion link here. Where is the, how to convert a number? Please see the base n conversion tool. So I clicked on base n conversion and then I would try and understand this algorithm, but I guess I just didn't get it right or I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not a thousand percent positive why I couldn't get it from octal. Because if it's just octal, that would make sense to me. And this apparently, the decode website says that it is, but with everything else, I had to rotate it and shift it by one. And that's confusing in my mind. <laughs> but either way, we have drilled down through this rabbit hole. We found some kind of neat stuff. It was fun to write that script and, and kind of parse out the logic of where we can't use this ActiveX object, we can just switch our eval to a console.log. And that was very, very cool because at the end, we're seeing legitimate code that uh, is very well used by malware. Like using these techniques for, with JScript to grade an object and download files and write them with an environment variable location for the temp directory, that I think is pretty real world and very, very cool. So that was a that was a fun challenge, but I'm still beating myself up about that stinking octal number. <laughs> so that's it. Holy cow, that uh, is the flag, right? We did we did get the flag, so we can go ahead and submit it, and we can call this guide point CTF done. But that was a blast. So. Hey, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for tuning in, tolerating this. If you did like this video, please do check out some of the other ones in this little mini series here. If you did like the capture the flag challenges or this event in this competition, go play GuidePoint's next game. They're doing this CTF for like a week every month for like the next six months or five months or four or, or something. But it, it's a, a rolling series and it's super duper fun. So I really recommend go jump in expose yourself to new technologies, try to solve some clever problems, and you're going to really learn a lot of fun stuff. So thanks so much for watching, everybody. I'll see you in the next video.